So I wanted to continue my live stream of Weekend Film Wave. I, I never really know what I'm going to talk about, honestly. Um, I was looking at some of these these Microsoft articles about Furiosa. I was just reading one that said there's 10 ways that Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, makes Free World even better. And... Uh, it's not this one. This is just a slideshow. Pretty much every action film that came out, huh? Abigail. Anyway, um, and, and this is this one right here. And now it's in the part where it explains why Furiosa barely speaks. I found this intriguing. Crucifies her mother. In front of him, she starts speaking. Before this event, she had been fairly talkative. Not really. She had full conversations with her mom and her friends, uh, and her friends in the green place. You know what? Let's let the AI read. More for you. No. Three. Looper. I love it when AI just, just goes against plans. Let's speak. There we go. Took a jump right to it. Piece of shit. Furiosa, a Mad Max saga works perfectly well as a standalone piece. Furiosa shines as a protagonist, and her journey works even without the context given by Mad Max, Fury Road. Dementis is one of the strongest antagonists in the fr However, Valkyrie and F related. How the original Mad Max trilogy over the The relationship between Immortan Joe and the People Eater is the those who wanted to see more, it provides a glimpse. Sorry, it's not, it's not reading from what I wanted to read from. Furiosa, a Mad Max saga works perfectly how- the rulers of the other town, Fury, relate this. The Mary Jabasa, like many characters in Furiosa, began as nothing more than a name mentioned during Furiosa's spiel trying to prove her identity to the remaining Vivalini. Those who wanted to see more of her, it provides a glimpse in, in Mad Max, Fury Road. Furiosa, on the other hand, takes audiences into the heart of both locations. Dementis takes control of Gastown, and audiences get to watch his thrilling raid on the refinery-based area. More importantly, they get to see him use the implements of the area as weapons, which makes the action sequence feel fresh in much the same way the scenes in previous installments have. Something similar occurs with the Bullet Farm, which Dementis also seizes by the end of the film, and where perhaps the movie's best choreographed fight occurs. These scenes make the other locations feel like real places rather than simply nameless entities ruled by frightening men as they were in Fury Road, which then adds some context to the fighting styles presented during that film's Road Wars. The Origin of the Organic Mechanic Related Furiosa, who is Chris Hemsworth's Dementis? Chris Hemsworth's Dementis has a very nuanced role in Furiosa, a Mad Max saga that turns him into one of the franchise's most despicable despots. The organic mechanic is one of the most iconic characters in Mad Max, Fury Road. Yep. As a Morton Joe's doctor, and therefore the one responsible for delivering his all-important children, he's one of the highest-ranking men in the Citadel. Yep. 
-hmm. He appears throughout the movie at various moments, mm -hmm. but perhaps the most important comes when a Morton Joe reclaims his favorite wife, Angherid the Splendid, from Furiosa. He delivers one of the movie's most chilling lines when he informs a Morton Joe that, had only another month passed, he would have had his first healthy son. Like so many other characters, his placement at the Citadel gains more context in Furiosa. At the beginning of the film, he works for Dementis and his biker, Horde, doing much the same thing as he did for a Morton Joe. However, much like Furiosa, Dementis proves that he views the organic mechanic as expendable. Dementis gives them over to a Morton Joe at the same time in exchange for control of Gaston and increased rations. Though there's not much else said about him, it still reveals how he ended up at the Citadel and answered one of the many pressing questions about his history. Boy. It shows how Furiosa lost her arm. Furiosa's metal arm proves to be one of her most valuable. So I'm going to pause it just for a second. So the whole aspect of the organic mechanic, when Dementis sees him as expendable, Joe and in Tone sees him as useful. And he's like, well, if he could be a good mechanic, maybe he could be he could do some uh, some of the medical work that I need him to do involving the delivery of uh, my offspring. And so, Dementis being a warlord, that, I mean, sorry, Immortan Joe being a tr tr strategic warlord that Dementis is not, he uh, he sees more in certain people as the woes than Dementis did. You know, and for Dementis, he's just really like a, a cook. He just cooks some of the dead bodies for for his army. You know, he, he does the same thing for Morton Joe's army, though. Valuable assets in Mad Max, Fury Road. For one, it's a safeguard against anyone trying to take her war rig from her. She programmed the vehicle to be synced to her biometrics so nobody else could use it, and there's an arm painted on the door so everybody knows it's hers as well. It works as a multi-tool, as demonstrated toward the end of Furiosa, when she uses it as a set of bolt cutters. It's one of her defining characteristics, which she learned to be proud of rather than seeing it as a weakness or injury. However, its origin is one of the most gruesome aspects of her story. In her youth, she tattooed a star map on her forearm to use to return to the green place once she escaped Dementis' clutches. Whenever she began to lose sight of her initial mission, she would glance at it and know that there was a better future for her out there as soon as she got the chance to pursue it. In the aftermath of her failed raid on Gastown, however, Dementis strings her up by her arm, which was already injured by a gnarly road incident when they entered that final confrontation, and makes her watch as he torments her companion Praetorian Jack. He turns his head for too long, It's actually after in the aftermath of her failed raid on Gastown. It's actually not in Gastown. It's in the on in, on the bullet form. It's uh, because Dementis has gained control of it, and he quotes quote unquote says, "I finally take gas. I finally take the bullet form, and you and y'all two just t take it away." I mean, he doesn't say it like that exactly, but that's essentially what he says. Long, however, and she severs her arms so she has the chance to escape. It's one of the greatest sacrifices she has to make and symbolizes how unlikely it is that she'll be able to make it home, while also giving an interesting backstory to one of her defining physical qualities. It explains why Furiosa barely speaks. One of the most interesting aspects of Furiosa's character as presented in Mad Max Fury Road is that she hardly speaks. Throughout the movie, Charlie's Theron only has 80 lines of dialogue, and in the prequel, Anya Taylor-Joy only speaks about 30. This allows her characterization to be built out through other means, such as her actions and mannerisms, rather than the way she talks. Taylor-Joy referred to her voice as rusty, like she's not quite sure how to use it anymore now that she chooses her words so carefully. 
Furiosa provides a reason for this. After Dementis crucifies her mother in front of him, she stops speaking. Before this event, she had been fairly talkative. She had full conversations with her mom and her friends in Green Place, which makes for a particularly jarring opening scene to the film since fans are so used to never hearing her talk. However, once she stopped talking, she never really started back up again. This makes it all the more impactful when she does choose to use her voice, such as at the film's conclusion during her final confrontation with Dementis, when her reticence turns to begging in the face of such abject desperation. It gives Furiosa a personal tie to the wives. So when her wives die, the quality of being was all... Oh. In the face of this pattern, this experience brings it to the maximum degree. Complete with that power. Mm. Furiosa's quest to aid the wives and rescue them from a Morton Joe's clutches drives the entire plot of Fury Road. Everything she does is to make sure they're safe and that they know they're on their way to a better life. Freedom waits on the horizon for them if only they will trust her. The only explanation given for why she's doing this comes when she reveals that she was stolen away from her family at a very young age. Since that day, she never got to know freedom. Her life was always lived in service to someone and she wanted to prevent anyone else from ever having to endure that. She's liberating herself as much as she is them. Furiosa adds another layer to this. Rather than simply framing it as the right thing to do as Fury Road does, it gives her a connection to their plight. When she first arrived in the Citadel, Immortan Joe added her to his harem. She witnessed their mistreatment firsthand. She felt the dangers of having his and his son's wandering gazes land on her. At a very young age, she saw the future that awaited her if she remained in the harem. He would eventually reduce her to nothing more than a vessel to carry children. That's no life, especially not for women as full of life as Furiosa and the Five Wives. Thus, as soon as she works her way up to having a vehicle that could potentially be used to set these women free, she seizes her opportunity. The pieces of her past revealed in Furiosa make this driving force of Fury Road that much more interesting in retrospect. Building out the green place makes its destruction more upsetting. Related. Furiosa makes the case for Chris Hemsworth playing DC's greatest villain. Chris Hemsworth's twisted and bloodthirsty Dementis in Furiosa, a Mad Max saga has the energy of a major Batman villain from 2008's The Dark Knight. In Mad Max, Fury Road, the green place was little more than a nebulous concept, much like Gastown and Bullet Farm. Perhaps more than anything, it represented an ideal. If the women could only make it to the green place, they would know peace and freedom once more. They wouldn't have to compete for the chance to live the way they did in the Citadel or other areas of the Wasteland. They'd get the chance to live in abundance. It would be a safe place for them to raise their children, which made it all the more upsetting when they found out that green place no longer existed. This was already a painful reveal even without ever getting to look into the green place, as it's clear from the women's reactions that they just lost what they saw as their only chance at liberation. However, getting to see into it in Furiosa, even if just for a moment, makes its destruction that much more upsetting. The contrast between its peaceful verdancy and the violent desert of the wasteland makes it feel like a haven for audiences, so watching Furiosa be ripped away from it so aggressively feels like a loss of comfort for them as well. It's the one place in the Mad Max franchise that doesn't feel like it could be a danger to anyone's safety, and losing that one area of safety underscores the brutality present in Fury Road. Furiosa's journey away from emotion makes her Fury Road breakdown more painful.
painful. One of the most gut-wrenching and memorable scenes in Fury Road occurs right after Furiosa reunites with the Vovolini. She asks them for instructions on how to return to Green Place, and they tell her that by this point, she should have passed it. Furiosa and the wives realize that the desolate, scarred area they went through a few days prior is all that remains of the world she thought would offer her a new beginning. Upon this revelation, Furiosa falls to her knees and lets out the most painful scream mm -hmm. she can muster. It's the first time anyone sees any real emotion out of her, which makes everything that much more upsetting. And, like most other scenes, Furioso itself makes this so much more distressing. The entire movie watches her move further away from showing any emotion. In her early interactions with her mother, the young Furiosa is expressive. She wears her heart and her fear on her sleeve, only to have her love for the world around her exploited by men such as Dementis. Throughout her solo film, audiences watch her move from the enthusiastic little girl presented in the prologue to the hardened warrior in Fury Road, and a lot of that has to do with the amount of loss she endures. As more and more people she grew to love were taken from her, she took steps closer to the Imperator of the original film. Watching her move toward this identity makes it even more distressing when that facade finally cracks. Mad Max, Fury Road. In a post-apocalyptic wasteland, a woman rebels against a... Okay, so it's just going to turn to me, but yeah, that makes me really... I really do actually want to go finish Fury Road. Um... That was just interesting. That kind of combats what the other woman said in the video, because it, it, even though that George Miller could have included that those already thoughts of a, uh, you know, of, uh, of what he had planned originally, it it still works. The film Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, it still works. So, just thought uh. That would be interesting. Let's see what this person has to say. Ready for faster internet? Get ultra reliable, ultra fast internet for just twenty dollars a month. And now we have Furiosa. It's George Miller. What do you want? Let's go. Yeah, Furiosa stars Anya Taylor Joy, Chris Hemsworth. Oh my god, that is a silly. That's a silly poster, though. Because she wasn't shaving her head with that on. Well. She kind of was, actually. Just imagine, though, if she had went that. But she was just that alone. That would have been like. Like, what is she, a, a member of a band, rock band? You know, with the whole scarf and the outfit. She looks like a member of, the rock, of a rock band. And is directed by George Miller. What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new 2024 review. We're going to do the brand new Mad Max movie, Furiosa. From the trailer, um, immediately I knew I got to see that day freaking one. It's George Miller. Um, George Miller, if you don't know, if you're not like a Mad Max uh, aficionado, and I'm not, Road Warriors like one of the greatest freaking movies ever made, okay? But I'm not the biggest fan of Beyond Thunderdome. I'm a casual fan of the first Mad Max. I mean, that that one freaking Thunderdome is like one of the greatest freaking movies ever made, okay? But I'm not the biggest fan of Beyond Thunderdome. I'm a casual fan of the first Mad Max. I mean, that... That one freaking scene where he makes the guy saw his own hand off. That's, that's freaking legendary. Um, but here comes freaking Mad Max Fury Road out of nowhere nine years ago. And, I mean, what? This was decades since Beyond Thunderdome? Man, I just remember when that movie came out. It really gave the movie industry the, the jolt that it needed in the uh, action genre. And it was just a reminder that uh, George Miller was back and stronger and better than ever. And uh, dare I say, that might be the best Mad Max movie of the whole bunch. 
You know, taking your nostalgia goggles out of the way. Yeah, Road Warrior, I love Road Warrior, but I gotta admit, I think Mad Max, if you want more of like an adrenaline junkie type movie that you could literally take the uh, Junkie XL score to the gym with you and work out to, if you're real all day, baby, it's just that good. And I'll tell you right now, this movie, it's really good, not as good as Fury Road. Uh, but I still think it's a great, worthy companion to Fury Road. It has all the, the great George Millerisms that you would want in a Mad Max movie. Um, it feels very much like a continuation, even though it's a prequel, of Fury Road. But this will be a spoiler-free review. I'm not going to drop any bombshells on you or anything. I'm just going to give you the the broad strokes of what I like. There's a couple of uh, things that uh, I didn't... I don't, don't want to say didn't like, but just a, a few a little annoyances about the movie. Um, but they kind of fall in line with if you're not a fan of what George Miller is all about in his movies, you might say the plot is thin. Uh, Fury Road, let's face it, that's one of the greatest freaking action movies of all time. The plot's thin. They're, they're, they're going to one location and coming back, I think. And that's it. Yeah. And uh, this movie's no different. Uh, I think the big action set piece that stood out in my mind about this movie was the, uh, the, the food transport. You know, they're transporting this food from A to B. The stunts in that scene are kind of jaw-dropping. Uh, you know, very similar to the last movie. But let's back up and give you a uh, plot synopsis. This is a Furiosa origin story. You get to see her entire life pretty much spread out throughout the entire movie. Aaliyah Brown plays the young version of Furiosa, and she takes up a good portion of this movie. I'd say maybe 30, maybe 45 minutes of this movie, maybe 30 minutes of this movie you're spending with the young Furiosa. Aaliyah, Aaliyah Brown. Some people say 30 minutes and other people say an hour. It's an entire hour at the least that she's playing it. Brown was fantastic as her. And she was in this year's Sting, which was a really fun movie. And I thought she looked familiar. And then I looked at IMDb and sure enough, yeah, it's her. So, yeah, I think they picked a great young Furiosa. But when Anya Taylor-Joy comes into the picture, man, she's just... She's got that it factor, you know. She has the the striking eyes, right? Uh, when she's first introduced, all you see is just her eyes, and you are just like, you know, awestruck. She just has a magnetic quality about her, and uh, she doesn't say that much uh, in this role. You know, this is a very quiet, silent character. She only speaks when she needs to. She's more about uh, evading capture. She has to go from one dangerous clan of people to another dangerous clan of people. This is one of those movies, I don't think there's any clear-cut good guy and bad guy outside of Furiosa. They're all freaking scumbags. You have um, a Mortan Joe that was in Furiosa. He is a character in this movie, and he really wants Furiosa. And then you have Chris Hemsworth playing this very eccentric character, Dr. Dementis. I really have to give Chris Hemsworth mad credit for, no, no pun intended, mad, but I have to really give him really? credit for his portrayal of this character. You know, this was a character that he really had to step outside of his comfort zone and I think really prove his acting chops. And uh, boy, does he. he. He definitely holds the screen. And Dementis is, is a really interesting character. I, I have to say that. I was a little worried but Chris Hemsworth is one of those guys that he constantly proves me wrong. I, just when I want to doubt him, he, he pulls out a performance that just kind of knocks my socks off. And that's the way he was in this. He's very eccentric. He's uh, funny at times, but he's still very dangerous. You know, he fits the mold of a Mad Max villain character perfectly. Like, I could see him in, in, like, the first Mad Max, and he would just fit right in. He's that type of character. And this movie is just full of eccentric, wild, fun characters throughout. As far as action, I think this has just as much action, if not more, than the previous movie. It's just full of great gearhead type action, you know. Uh, I'm talking about, like, the guys that are really into cars. I'm not really into cars that much, but I love the sound of a roaring engine. Or dope bikes or motorcycles. And with a you know with great sound design on the big screen, I saw this in IMAX, and you can't help it; it's undeniable. And there's there's like one scene in this movie where I mean the engine seems like it's amplified, and I'm like, this will be the only time I will ever experience 
the earth shattering sound of actually feeling like I'm inside a car engine. I, if I watch this at home, it's not going to be the same thing. You have to see this in IMAX. You probably already know that anyway. This is just that type of movie. But for two and a half hours, I think it's paced really well because that first half hour, you're getting to know Furiosa as a child. And then once she becomes uh, an adult or a young adult, you're off and running throughout the rest of the movie. I have to mention this one character that so reminded me of Stacy Keach. Praetorian Jack, played by Tom Burke. And uh, he has a, uh, a hair lip. Uh, in the movie but I don't think the, the real actor has a hair lip okay but uh, in the movie he's got one that it goes like all the way up the side of his face as you would expect um, a Mad Max character to have you know these are just war torn characters and he kind of just pops in the movie out of nowhere and establishes this bond with Furiosa and takes her under his wing and this is where I do get a little bit into the cons because I think they rushed this relationship between the two and I, I feel like Maybe there was a, a three-hour version of this movie where they explored their relationship more because they're thrust together really quick, and then you get this big action scene, and then the next thing you know, uh, we're kind of forced into buying this undeniable chemistry that they're supposed to have, but I don't think the relationship earned its importance, and it is an important relationship, but I just don't think we were given enough time with them, and I think this movie, at two and a half hours, they're trying to get from point A to point B, which is really what this, this movie is, but even in like the, the character beats, you know, and, and uh, the relationships and all that stuff, I felt like some of that stuff was kind of rushed for action's sake, and don't get me wrong, the action is amazing, um, but I guess another con that I would give the movie, um, comparing this to previous uh, Mad Max movies, even Fury Road, I felt like the practical took a back seat to a lot of CGI. Uh, I just felt like a lot of what I was watching was CGI. Sometimes it, it's, it really stuck out like a sore thumb. Looking back at Fury <laughs> So many people were saying that. Stuck out like a sore thumb. I bet when I see Fury Road, I can understand what they're saying. Fury Road, I'm I'm shocked that they were able to pull off what they pulled off um, practically in that movie. And I'm sure they probably used a little bit of CGI. But if they did in that movie in Fury Road, I, sh I sure didn't notice it as much. Whereas in this movie, it's definitely there. You're going to notice it. There's no denying. You're gonna be like, yeah, that's definitely CGI. But overall, guys, uh, definitely a low purchase worthy for Furiosa. I mean, if you're looking for just a fun, high-octane action movie uh, with really great performances by Anya Taylor-Joy and Chris Hemsworth, then definitely check this movie out. And when you do, let me know what you thought in the comments. Looking forward to hearing them. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks, where we talk horror all day and every day on Fridays. Rudy Fever Fridays. Follow me on Drumdoms on my social, Spring and Patreon. Become a channel member, buy me a coffee. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Drumdom out. It was a dream to return to the world of Dune. Getting to see Denis bring his full vision to life. This shoot has been glorious. The one movie that I had 0.0, .0 clue oh. how it was going to go was The Watchers. I just got out of The Watchers. Let's review The Watchers. <laughs> the Watchers stars Dakota Fanning, Georgina Campbell, mm. Owen Fuhrer, and is directed by Ishana Shyamalan. What's up guys, welcome to a brand new 2024 review. We're going to review the new Shyamalan movie, uh, Ishana Shyamalan, uh, M. Night's daughter, The Watchers. And uh, I didn't think it was going to be horrible, but I was a little nervous because this is her first feature film. And having said that, of course, I'm going to, I guess, cut her some slack. No one sees one and survives. They have come to our world for a reason. I'm not supposed to be here, and I'm not staying here. Look, anybody that does their first feature film, mm -hmm. I think they look at it as a, a lesson. You know, I, I think of like Steven Spielberg, even though Jaws wasn't technically his first, he did um, a movie before that called Duel, I think. But he did say when he thinks about Jaws, he thinks about courage and stupidity um, just because of, you know, you don't realize how tough of a task it is to create a movie. Stop. 
until you actually do it. And, uh, you know, he was young. Mm -hmm. And when you're young, you're, you're often uh, more uh, naive uh, and more uh, creative. Hell, some people even say that maybe Jaws was an accidental cultural phenomenon. I think sometimes a movie can be great almost by accident. As long as you have all the pieces in play, right? Like the script and everything. But if one of those pieces, those vital pieces isn't in play, then everything's just gonna fall through the cracks. And that leads me to The Watchers. I think you can already tell what my opinion of this movie is. Um, let's get into this. It's not all bad, but uh, boy, does it have some problems. Some, some really, really big problems. So first off, let's give you a quick plot synopsis. Dakota Fanning plays uh, Mina. She works at this pet store. She's also a, a, a struggling artist, starving artist. And she's given this task from her boss at the pet store to go deliver this parrot or this bird. I think it's a parrot uh, to somebody that's uh, quite a quite a ways away, you know. So she's got to go through this forest in Ireland, and uh, there's this whole mystery around this forest. Uh, and the movie opens with it's a cliche opening, okay, for a, a, a horror movie, especially with, uh, you know, the forest and everything, y you, you kind of get the idea that they're going to set things up, I guess, like Jaws, where, you know, remember Chrissy in the beginning of Jaws, that wonderful, well, one of the greatest horror openings, I think, ever. This is a very similar opening, uh, you know, one guy running around in the forest, you already know what's going to happen, you know, he's he's going past this barrier in the form of a sign because there are signs spaced around the forest. And if you go too far, then these creatures are going to get you. And of course, that's what happens. And there's nothing new or creative in this opening scene. It's so cliche. And um, I know I'm being hard, but you don't want the movie to open with just a, a roaring cliche that makes you roll your eyes. But anyway, so she goes to this forest. She is lost. There is definitely a supernatural aspect to this forest that is set up at the beginning of the movie and it plays with your mind. And so she's looking for shelter and she finds this place and she sees these other three people, which this sort of made me think of Knock at the Cabin. Actually, M. Night's last movie, which I thought was very good, very effective. But these these three people, they're the I guess the leader of them is this character Madeline. She's you know she's the wiser, the older one, and uh, she gives her the rule. See, I, I didn't I didn't remember the opening of how she got there to that uh to the forest, and I forgot that uh, I didn't even know that the pair like a uh, an assignment from work. I just thought she was trying to do a vacation or whatever, and I, th I thought that the parrot was a gift, so she took it with her. You, you can't turn your back on the mirror. You know, the, the mirror is kind of like a two-way mirror, and uh, these creatures, they want to look at the people inside this room uh, it, during a certain time period, uh, you know, at night. During the day, they can go out and go into the forest, but they can't go past the barrier, all right? So that's, that's the whole setup. If they go past the barrier, then it's bad juju. Now, I guess to start off with so some... I thought that they couldn't go out. I thought they'd only be attacked at night. Um, but it does make sense that they can't go past the barrier because that's what they do. But it's only during the daytime. Because if they try to go past the barrier at night, they'll be killed before they even get past the first sign. So if they're going to risk it, it's... It's better to do it during the daytime, you know, because that's when they least like to appeal. But I forgot that they were supposed to appeal past those barriers because the guy was obviously attacked during the daytime. I'm like, okay, now I remember. Some uh, pros about this movie. I do see the ambition there. I do see the uh, the passion behind the project. Uh, Ishana co-wrote this this story. I could tell that you know she she had some really lofty ideas in her head about this story. The film is shot very well. As a matter of fact, you could uh, if if you were told that M Night Shyamalan shot this movie, you might believe it. You know, uh, until you literally watch the entire thing and you start noticing all the the plot holes and the character archetypes all that stuff beautifully shot film also really nice score 
in this movie. You know, it's not overbearing. It doesn't get in the way. It's not repetitive. It's placed quite well. Some nice musical cues. And I am a music guy. I love good music in movies. So I have to give it that. And I'll, I'll even say the last 15 minutes is what you're here for. Uh, I literally was wanting to saw my own head off until we finally got to the last 15 minutes, which is pretty much like the reveal of the movie. Yeah, and it wasn't the reveal. Like, like the, the say, it, it wasn't like it wasn't the 15 minutes though. It got me. It was the whole when it started actually going into the lore of the legend of the fairies and like why the the forest was called devil. Like oh my god, that's a that's an amazing reveal. No. I just like how it all played out. You know, it was pretty mm -hmm. intense. And I, I did like that. The actual reveal itself, I, I, I pretty much figured it out anyway. Hell, I'll even say this. Once, she, you know, she gets into that room with these other three characters, you're automatically going to start forming your own conclusions about who these characters are, especially once we're set up with the, the motivations of the creatures. And you're probably not going to be surprised on how it all unfolds. Now, here's... Uh, the the many big problems of this movie uh, character decisions when Mina gets into this forest she is lost she's by herself it's getting dark any person is going to be freaking out even if you're like a survival type person which she's not she's got to deliver a freaking bird right um, once she gets into this place with these people there's no like um, freaking out or or uh, panicking or anything like that. It's just like it's just like she just went into the store next door. That that's what it's like, and she's literally in this room, knowing that there's already some kind of weird supernatural aspect to this, and she's not freaking out. I'm sorry, anybody, 99.9% .9 of people, unless you're completely psychotic, you'd be freaking out if you knew that there's uh, a good chance you're not going to find safety. You're not going to get back to reality. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I, and I think that extends to all the characters in this movie. They're all very one-dimensional. Yeah, they tell a little bit of, uh, you know, not really even their backstory. Just, I guess, their current story is what you get. You, you might get a little bit of that stuff, but none of it is um, crucial to the plot. And, and I think they just do a really bad job of making you get invested in these characters, liking these characters. Even the main character, Mina, who is the most um, interesting. I will give Dakota Fanning that. And I think the acting across the board, you know, these are very competent actors. But the problem is the characters that they're playing are so paper thin and one dimensional that it's hard to really latch on to anything. Another big problem about this movie, it is boring. It, it is extremely boring. This is a, a thriller, supposedly a horror movie. There's literally nothing that feels uh, intense. There's just no build in this movie uh, from start to finish. It's pretty much all the same type cadence. I think there's um, way too much tell and very little show. Actually, I take that back. I think there's plenty of show, uh, in, in especially in terms of like who these creatures are, but it's all just a CGI fest. And, uh, you know, I don't mind CGI used sparingly and um, strategically, but when it comes to, okay, I want to show you what's going to scare you. If you make it so painfully obvious that it's CGI, it's not going to creep me out. It's just not going to work in terms of horror. And there are some nice shots in this movie. Beautiful shots. And I don't think it's cliche. I think the potential is there, but they just never deliver it because it doesn't have the backbone of the characters and even the backbone of the story. The story is just not interesting. And once you do figure out what's going on and uh, who the creatures are, at least for me, I was kind of like, that's it? Really? Okay, I guess. And taking all these cons that I'm giving you, the number one thing uh, out of all of it is boredom. If you bore me in a movie, you have committed the ultimate movie sin. I don't want to be bored in movies at all. You know, I... I that, that he... he um... He stresses on a good point. Like that's how I felt. I mean, I'm I'm like slouching in my chair and.
I'm actually tempted to get up and leave at one point. I'm literally like, kind of like Eric Weber, what he does. You know, he leans back, he sleeps a lot. I, I look, if I had been really tired, and I slept during, uh, I slept during uh, some of uh, Civil War because I was just tired, and that is more interesting than this because at least Civil War is uh, thought provoking. This movie wasn't really thought provoking; it was just. Boring, and I'm like, wait, I'm basically asking for the big reveal. I'm asking for, okay, just show us the creatures and show us like the origin story and why they're there and what's going on and shit, and then and give us the resolution and leave it at that. I don't care for any jump scares at this point, you know. I wasn't, I didn't want a jump scare, I really just wanted it to end. And, and if you, and, and if the viewer, or the audience is asking for that, then you're not doing good in the movie. I'd rather be scratching my head trying to figure things out and being at least somewhat entertained. But when I am just like, I, I want to look at my, my uh, phone to find out what time it is, how much longer is, does this thing need to go on? Just because there's just no, like I said, there's no hills and valleys in terms of uh, the story and the scares. It just doesn't feel like that. These characters are not interesting at all. And it's a shame I really wanted this movie to be great, but it just wasn't that at all. I think it had a nice setup, but I think a lot of it was cliche, and I think a lot of the story wasn't fleshed out like it needed to be. Not that I was confused. I wasn't confused at all. It's just a, the story. I think there just needed to be more depth uh, to the characters and the story. So, yeah. So, guys, oh my God, this movie, uh, I'll give it a two hours loss, and I'm being very, very kind, all right? But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll never watch this again. And if I had to compare this to the rest of uh, M. Night Shyamalan's films, which I didn't do that on purpose. I didn't think that was fair. I'd, if, if he directed this, this might be his worst film. If he, But you know, luckily it was just his daughter. And you know what? Kudos to her for putting out her first movie. And uh, again, I think there were some uh, interesting elements, potential. But, uh, yeah, outside of that, it's just a bad film. It's just a really bad film. There's so many bad films out there, you know? Keep going. Make another film. Make it better. Learn from this experience. That's the best thing I can tell you. You know? And I and I do see the promise there. And I think Ishana, um, I, maybe she needs to be under her father's wing a, a little bit more to learn more about the craft of storytelling. She's got the technical aspects of it down, I think. It's the storytelling, you know? I think that's where she needs some work. So that's my review for The Watchers. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts uh, in the comments. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks, where we talk horror all day and every day. And on Fridays, we review our Fridays. Follow me Drum Dums on my socials. Support me on Patreon. Buy me a coffee. And anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Drum Dum out. Anyway, yes. Now that doctor's... So, uh, yeah, that movie was not as good. And this movie came out, like, last week, so it's not, you know. Uh, yeah, I gotta say, it's just, uh, it's, uh. It wasn't that great, you know. Which is good. I'm getting a little bit tired. So, I kind of wanted to watch a little bit of this. So this movie came out. This movie came out uh, earlier this year. Uh, kind of unrelated. Bits. What do y'all think? We could look at more articles. Like, there's the title, chapter titles explained. Hmm. Huh. Okay. A pole of inaccessibility. Warning. This article contains Furios the chap Furiosa's chap Furiosa. Um since Furiosa related. Mad Max had the pole of inaccessibility. The pole the pole Mad Max has an interesting cameo in Furiosa raising questions not only about who plays him but also about his future in the George Miller franchise. The Pole of Inaccessibility Furiosa's story began with her being completely isolated. For those of you who are wondering, like, well, if Mad Max is even in 
even in Furiosa, he is, and he's played, portrayed by his stunt double. Isolated. The stunt double of the, the stunt double for Tom Hardy from Fury Road. But also his stunt double like Tom's chosen stunt double, period. Isolated. The first chapter of Furiosa, the pole of inaccessibility, saw Furiosa and her mother, Mary Jabasa, fighting Dementis gang both to escape back to the green place and to keep its location secret. While Mary and Furiosa did manage to keep the green place a secret, they failed to escape, and Mary was tortured and killed while Furiosa was taken as Dementis prisoner. It was a decidedly dark and hopeless start to her story, and it has a fittingly solitary title to accompany it. The Pole of Inaccessibility is one of Furiosa's most vague and thematically rich chapter titles. In the real world, a pole of inaccessibility is a term used in geography to describe the point on a landmass or ocean that is furthest away from the nearest coastline. For example, the pole of inaccessibility of Australia is where the ocean is as far away as possible in every direction, which is nearly in the center of the continent, west of Alice Springs in the Northern Territory. Much like a pole of inaccessibility, Furiosa was completely isolated. The pole of inaccessibility as a title in Furiosa could be a literal reference to the geographical concept as both the Green Place and Dementis Group were located very far inland in Australia. The beginning of the movie could have taken place at the continent's actual pole of inaccessibility, but it likely has a much more nuanced meaning. After her mother's death, Furiosa was completely alone in the world. She had been taken from the many mothers and her sister at the Green Place, the only home she had ever known, and put in the midst of strange people who wanted to do her harm. Much like a pole of inaccessibility, Furiosa was completely isolated. The pole of inaccessibility put her in the middle of nowhere, which set up the rest of Furiosa and Mad Max, Fury Road, as she spent the next several years trying to get back to the green place. Lessons from the Wasteland Furiosa learned to be brutal by watching Dementis. The next chapter of Furiosa, Lessons from the Wasteland, picked up a fairly significant time after the pole of inaccessibility. Furiosa was still in Dementis captivity, but her hair had noticeably grown out, and she was much more resigned to her fate as a prisoner. Lessons from the Wasteland saw Furiosa try. Warning: This article contains Fur the chap Fur Sorry. related Furiosa Mad Map the pole Furiosa the first the pole much like a the pole after her mother's death. Lessons from the Wasteland. Furiosa learned to be brutal by watching Dementis. The next chapter of Furiosa, yeah. Lessons from the Wasteland, picked up a fairly significant time after the pole of inaccessibility. Furiosa was still in Dementis captivity, but her hair had noticeably grown out, and she was much more resigned to her fate as a prisoner. Lessons from the Wasteland saw Furiosa traveling with Dementis gang and seeing how they brutalized the Wasteland. A great scene that illustrated that brutality was Dementis' initiation ritual, in which he forced his victims to fight to the death and execute one of their own by quartering him for a chance to join the gang. Eventually, Dementis and his gang took control of Gastown by hijacking one of a Morton Joe's rigs and using it to hide some of their members. Then, when they made a play to extort Joe, it turned out that Joe wanted Furiosa to be one of his breeders. Dementis agreed to sell her in exchange for a better deal on food. After a Morton Joe started grooming Furiosa to be one of his breeders, his son, Rictus, started to take an interest in her. To save herself from Rictus, Furiosa cut her hair off and went into hiding, marking a major step in her transformation. Related Where to Watch Furiosa A Mad Max Saga Furiosa A Mad Max Saga brings the action franchise back, and there are different options for where to watch the prequel starring Anya Taylor-Joy. Throughout the chapter, 
Furiosa was watching intently, even when Dementis allowed her to close her eyes. As the title, Lessons from the Wasteland, suggests, Furiosa was learning about how brutal the world beyond the green place was and how to survive in it. During her time with Dementis, Furiosa learned that brutality was the most effective language of the wasteland and that those who survive are the ones who are willing to kill. During her time at the Citadel, Furiosa learned that the only person who would protect her was herself and that if she was to survive, she had to sacrifice who she once was. The Stowaway Furiosa was a stowaway on the war rig, but she needed to be a road warrior. The lessons Furiosa learned in Lessons from the Wasteland informed the next chapter of her journey, the stowaway. For years, Furiosa hid herself as one of a Morton Joe's workers, biding her time until she could escape. That chance came when the war rig was finally completed and Praetorian Jack took it to make a delivery. To escape, Furiosa chained herself to the undercarriage of the truck, along with a motorcycle and some supplies. Furiosa was somewhere between the little girl at the start of the movie and the fifth rider of the apocalypse she would become at the end. The stowaway seems like the most straightforward of Furiosa's chapter titles, but it's also possible to read into it further. Furiosa's plan to escape via the bottom of the war rig literally made her a stowaway, as she wasn't a known passenger, but how it actually played out made her much more than that. Actually, she was a known passenger because they deliberately looked for her as the mechanic on board of the... And she, even one of the characters who hands her the, uh, the fuel line in the uh, clamp, knows that she's there, so it was planned. That. The war rig was attacked. It does, however, demonstrate to me how and why there was a motorcycle, there was a dope bike chained to the bottom of the war rig. I, it was, I've been questioning why it was, as well as food. I thought the food was meant for as a trade, but I thought the dope bike was kind of like an escape pod, if you will, if they needed it or something. But I think now I know it was hoes attacked, and Furiosa fought well enough that she even caught the attention of Praetorian Jack. He then offered to help her learn to wage road war, which hinted at the true meaning of this chapter being called the stowaway. The Furiosa shown in Fury Road was a wrathful warrior, but in the stowaway, Furiosa was far from a legendary fighter. Because she wasn't who she had to become yet, the stowaway acts as a midpoint for Furiosa, as she was being far too passive in her own escape. Furiosa was somewhere between the little girl at the start of the movie and the fifth rider of the apocalypse she would become at the end during the stowaway. While she fought valiantly during the attack on the war rig, Furiosa still had quite a bit of development development left, and much more pain left to endure. Homeward. Furiosa was ready to return to the green place, but she hadn't found true fury yet. Homeward brought Furiosa closer to the person she was supposed to be, but it didn't get her all the way there quite yet. This chapter showed Furiosa after another significant amount of time that she spent learning from Praetorian Jack. Through their various journeys in the war rig, Furiosa had learned all the combat skills she needed to survive the trip to the green place, and Jack told her that she was ready to go. Before they could leave together, though, Dementis ambushed them at the bullet farm, tortured and killed Jack, and was the reason Furiosa lost her arm. Dementis interference ties directly into this chapter's title. Furiosa was finally homeward bound, she had the skills she needed, and she was ready to make her escape with Jack.
They were so close to freedom, and Furiosa was so close to her home, before Dementis took that from her as well. If it hadn't been for his plans to take over the three fortresses of the wasteland, Furiosa's story might have ended very differently. In an odd way, though, Dementis actually helped Furiosa in Homeward, as she still needed one final thing to become the character she was in Fury Road. Related. Every Mad Max movie, ranked worst to best. George Miller has made five Mad Max movies in the post-apocalyptic franchise. Furiosa may have been capable of leaving in Homeward, but she hadn't truly lived up to the fury her name is based on yet. No. She was obviously filled with rage over what Dementis had done, but it hadn't consumed her yet. Furiosa was named after Fury, and she essentially acts as its physical embodiment, so she couldn't let Dementis, the man who had taken everything from her, walk away. Furiosa had one final challenge to overcome and one final transformation to make before she was ready to return to the green place. Beyond Vengeance Furiosa inflicted a fate far worse than mere revenge on Dementis. Dementis' fate showed that this chapter truly was beyond vengeance. It was Furiosa's rebirth. After Dementis' takeover of the Bullet Farm, Furiosa warned Immortan Joe of his plans, and the 40-day wasteland war began. Furiosa got her mechanical arm, which completed her physical transformation into her Fury Road character, but she still had one last step to take to truly become that warrior. Furiosa set out to finally get her revenge on Dementis and become the human form of Fury. After an intense standoff in the wasteland, Furiosa ultimately settled on a fate for him. She planted the seed she had carried with her from the green place in Dementis' abdomen, turning him into food for the tree. Dementis' fate showed that this chapter truly was beyond vengeance. It was Furiosa's rebirth. She took all the lessons she learned over the course of the movie and used them against Dementis. She literally went beyond vengeance. Furiosa didn't simply kill Dementis. She kept him alive to torture him for years to come. She didn't give him the release of death. She turned him into a different form of life. Furiosa got so much more than vengeance. She got even on an existential level. Furiosa destroyed everything Dementis stood for and made him live as a husk of what he used to be. By the end of Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, Furiosa had finally completed her journey to Mad Max, Fury Road. It was a massive road to get there, though, and one that spanned several years. Luckily, the chapters and their titles helped guide Furiosa along the path and even added more meaning to her revenge quest. Understanding the meaning behind Furiosa, a Mad Max saga's chapter titles makes the movie even more thought-provoking and poignant, which is an impressive feat indeed. Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. I wonder who wrote this article. Hey, interesting. I think this is just going to repeat and weaken on a lot of the stuff that's already been said.
Mm. Okay, well, this is all it is about three hours. So. It's getting kind of dull at this point, and kind 